Hey, lovely humans. What if I told you that tank controls almost single-handedly made the Resident Evil franchise? Is that even true? Well, kind of. Here's the story of how tank controls not only helped make Resident Evil one of the biggest pop culture franchises, but crushed the creator along the way. Let's go! Let's start by establishing the definition of tank controls. It refers to moving a character based on the direction they are facing and not being contingent on camera angles. Very similar to operating an RC car. In fact, based on the Japanese name for the control scheme, Rajikon Sosa, it more directly translates to operation via radio controls, which is pretty fitting. One stick is forward and backward movement, the other is for turning your wheels left and right. So here's the deal, folks. Tank controls suck. But around the time of the first 3D capable consoles, like when the original PlayStation came out, game developers were boldly creating games in this wild new 3D space. It was a vast frontier of how to balance movement and camera angles. Some games got it right. Love it. And some games were Earthworm Jim 3D. It's so bad, y'all. Many very successful games of the PlayStation era ended up opting into tank controls as the solution to the nascent camera angle problem. This includes Resident Evil, Tomb Raider, Grim Fandango, just to name a few. Resident Evil wasn't even the first game to use them. That honor belongs to Alpha Waves. Haven't heard of that one? You're not alone. It's just another example of being remembered for doing it best, not doing it first. One of the most notable aspects of Alpha Waves was its engine, which was a predecessor for Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil's older, less successful horror sibling. And very much like siblings, there's hot debate over whether Resident Evil or Alone in the Dark were the originator of the survival horror genre. Capcom's Tokuro Fujiwara fell in love with the idea of making a horror video game ever since Capcom created Sweet Home, a 1989 Famicom title that was as much of a horror game as 8-bit could muster. Fujiwara began a years-long passion project to find the perfect title to bring his vision of an atmospheric horror video game to life. Resident Evil was that game, and Tank Controls became the solution to a new problem. How can we offer the tension of a horror movie in a 3D video game? The most impactful aspect of tank controls were that they forced the player to slow down and allowed developers to use very intentional cinematic camera angles to further craft the atmosphere of their world and mirror the look and feel of horror movies. Capcom, the developers of Resident Evil, made the choice to use this control scheme to enable such a revolutionary game on such limited hardware. In a 2000 interview with Resident Evil director Shinji Mikami, he shares that despite his reservations about and awareness of the frustrations of tank controls, they actually ended up making the game more popular due to the way they slowed the pacing, increased the difficulty, and aided the team in controlling the camera angle to build further tension. Players could hear the danger long before they could see it. Mikami goes on, for Resident Evil controls, I had always intended to improve and fix them someday. However, what happened was the game blew up in popularity before I had that chance. 
And then, because people had become used to these controls, if I went and changed them, it would make people angry." End quote. I could totally see the conundrum for Mikami here. I do question how he felt he could have fixed tank controls, though. Unless he was referring to one of the two later released Resident Evil director's cuts, first in 1997 and then again in 1998 as the greatest hits. That certainly would have been a huge risk to address it at that point. So I hear you. Right now you're saying, I get it. Tank controls suck, but I see how they help cement Resident Evil as a franchise we know and love today. But what about the other half of the title? Seems like things worked out pretty well for good old Mikami. They did. They worked out great. He's one of the most prolific folks in video games, and he's churned out hit after hit. But the frustration of deadlines and being forced to go with a control scheme that he worried may prove too hard a learning curve for new players, it all took a toll. In that same 2000 interview, he says, quote, I wince when people tell me that the poor controls in Resident Evil helped contribute to the sense of dread and horror, because that wasn't my intention. It was kind of embarrassing. And when journalists would ask me questions like, how does it feel to sell a million copies? My honest feeling was, well, not that great. And the more interviews I did, the more depressed I got. I get it. Being lauded for something that you see as a shortcoming has to feel pretty odd. The sort of cognitive dissonance Makami must have felt had to be hard to swallow amid the success that he should have felt so proud of. Obviously over time and with maturity, as well as many additional successes under his belt, his feelings have changed on the matter, but what an interesting slice of gaming history. To be able to travel back in time to see a younger, successful Shinji Mikami feeling very vulnerable about how the creative process of video games sometimes turns out. Truly a lovely nugget of gaming history. Listen, I think we can all agree, Mikami included, that we are happy to leave tank controls in the rearview mirror. I love taking this deep dive with you all. All of my sources used are in the description, and I've got many more Resident Evil hidden history to share in some upcoming videos. Are there some fun stories you think I should know about? Let me know in the comments. I want to hear from you. And help me defeat the algorithm by liking and subscribing if you think I've earned it. Until next time, I'll holler at y'all later.